know that this is now our new normal. We have these continued uh, through 2021 now, um, the same as, as, as last year. Uh, we thank you that you are continuing to pray for us. We know uh, many of you are praying for us, and we are so thankful for that. Without your prayers, in fact, uh, we would not be able to continue uh, without your prayers, and I really believe that, that your prayers are just as important as, as our prayers for you. And uh, just as I pray for all of you, thank you for praying for your church, for this church, for us, uh, for myself. Um, we uh, look into the book of Galatians, and last week we, uh, we talked about how we uh, receive the good news of Christ's death, and that will naturally lead to uh, sacrificial giving. Uh, for the sake of others. Today, uh, now that we've received this salvation by grace, uh, we are going to look at how do we now live by the Holy Spirit? How do we now live by the Holy Spirit? Now, as the people began to pressure the Galatian uh, Christians into observing the law, uh, being uh, like Jews, uh, this was Paul's response back in Galatians 2.16. People were pressuring certain Jewish, uh, certain believers or certain Gentile believers to behave like Jews, to be circumcised like Jews. Paul's response back in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 was, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. No one will be justified by the works of the law. That is a clear declaration from the Apostle Paul that salvation is only by grace through faith. And furthermore, Paul says in Galatians 2, 19 and 20, For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And my, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So he's clear in that the only way to live as Christ calls us, he says, which is to be living sacrificially by grace through faith, the only way to live as Christ calls us to is by dying to ourselves and allowing Christ to live in us. And that's what he means in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is not longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we talked about that, how it's the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in us, empowers us to live the life that he calls us to. And without the Holy Spirit, we simply cannot live the life he calls us to at all. We will fail. And so the question is, this morning, how? How does this occur? How do we allow Christ to live in us and to empower us to live by grace through faith? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now again, facing pressure from some Jewish believers at the time, some of the non-Jewish Galatian Christians were then deciding to be circumcised like Jews because of the pressure from Jewish believers to saying that you must be circumcised in order to receive salvation. Okay, in addition to be receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, some Jewish believers were saying or adding to the gospel of grace the need to be circumcised. Some of the non-Jewish Galatian believers were deciding to be circumcised like Jews. And why would they do such a thing? Well, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, 
You cannot be saved. You cannot be saved unless you are circumcised like us Jews. That's what they were telling them. And so some of the uh, Galatian believers believed them, were pressured by them, and therefore they were being circumcised just to be safe. And Paul's response to this, of them, of some of the Galatians falling into that, being falling into the pressure of becoming like Jews, following the Jewish laws like circumcision, because, because they believe that that was a requirement for salvation, Paul's response in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, is this. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Foolish Galatians. Foolish, he calls them. Paul was clearly distraught because their actions were a clear departure from the good news of salvation by grace through faith. And that would mean that on the day of judgment, they were going to be trusting in their works, which is circumcision in this case, rather than on Christ alone. And that is a dangerous thing to have. In fact, you can't be saved that way. If you trust in any works, you will not be justified. You will not be righteous in God's sight. It's only by grace through Christ alone. And so if they were to be judged by their works, as he says in verse 16 of chapter 2, no one will be justified. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. He just got through saying that in Galatians 2.16. And so they were in big trouble if they were now falling into living by works. It would mean that on the day of judgment, they would continue to be separated from God. Imagine that. Starting out with grace, but then falling into trying to justify themselves by works and being separated from God because of it. Because they were bewitched, he says. And so understandably, Paul called the Galatians believers foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? See, Paul calls the Galatian believers foolish for abandoning salvation by grace alone. They were bewitched. That means they were deceived. They were tricked. They were charmed by flattery. Oh, become one of us, and then you will receive the full benefits of being a child of Abraham, like us. They were charmed by flattery. They were charmed and bewitched by false promises. And this is often done by appealing to their emotions. In fact, Paul says in verse 1, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That's how you are saved. Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, not by your works. And it was publicly portrayed before your eyes that Christ was crucified. And so through the life of Paul and the preaching of Paul, the Galatians saw firsthand with their own eyes, he says. It was before your eyes that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That was through Paul's preaching. That was Paul through Paul's life, his sacrificial life. We talked about all the things he suffered as a believer in Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. All the things that Paul was going through and enduring as a believer, they saw that. And all the things they heard from Paul through his preaching, they heard that. They knew, they saw through Paul's crucified lifestyle how he suffered, for preaching the good news. As we saw in Galatians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, Paul he said, he reminded them five times, I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst often without food, in cold, and exposure. All these things Paul suffered through 
And we talked about that last Sunday. Why would Paul suffer and willingly through all those things for the sake of the good news? And so they knew through Paul's sacrificial life, they saw with their own eyes how he sacrificed for their case, that that he was doing it because Jesus was crucified for, for him and for all of us. They also knew that Paul endured all these things for the sake of Jesus Christ, that he was crucified for our sake. Jesus was crucified for our sake, and this is how we first receive the Holy Spirit, which dwells within every believer. It is through the crucified Christ. Once we receive Jesus as his, and his sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, then the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within every believer, comes to dwell within us. Receiving the crucified Christ for our sins is the way that we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. This cross, this forgiveness is something that we need to return to every single day. And the reason is because we still sin pretty much every day, right? We still sin every day, and so that we, that we need to get forgiveness every day. And the only way you're going to get forgiveness each time is through the crucified Christ, through his death on the cross, not by works, not by circumcision or the kosher diet or any other laws that we can make up as believers. In fact, Jesus said to pray, remember in Matthew chapter 6, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, he says, pray like this, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts to saying, forgive us our spiritual debts, our sins, our transgressions. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven our debtors. Now I ask you, how often do you need food? Okay, Every day, right? Most of you, all of you eat every day, don't you? And so what does he say? Pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. So how often do you need food? Your daily bread, every day. How often do you need forgiveness? Every day. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Just as you need food every day, you need forgiveness every day because we sin every day. And the only way you're going to receive forgiveness is through the death of Christ. Daily you need food. Daily, you need forgiveness. And if you start going by works and saying, well, I do all these things for the church and I do things for God and I give and I do these things and those, therefore, because I did these things that therefore I have forgiveness, you're, you're, you're being bewitched again, just like the Galatians. You're being foolish. It's only by the cross of Christ that we receive salvation and the Holy Spirit. If you were to ask people, any believer, When do they feel closest to God? Ask people that question. When do you feel closest to God? Ask yourself that question. When have you felt closest to God? When you ask most believers that question, many would say, well, I feel closest to God when I'm out in nature, for example, or in a forest, or I'm at a national park when I see God's creation. Maybe they say that. Or they feel like maybe they're closest to God when they're at a retreat and they're in close fellowship with other believers and they're singing songs, worship songs together and they have their their other believing friends with them and they're in close fellowship at a retreat. Maybe that's when they feel closest to God. But do you know when I feel closest to God? I feel closest to God immediately after I confess my sins. Immediately after I confess my sins. That's when I feel closest to God. Have you ever confessed your sins to God before? You ever noticed that sometimes you almost feel lighter in some ways? You almost feel lighter, like a a burden has been lifted off your shoulders after you've confessed your sins. See, some people, uh, they feel like, you know, afraid to confess their sins because they think, well, God is going to be angry. No, he says, confess your sins. And by the cross of Christ, he will forgive you. And so after confessing our sins, In this way, you will feel freer. You will feel stronger in faith. You will feel that it takes you back to the cross and what Jesus did for us. And you will feel his forgiveness. You will sense his forgiveness and you will feel 
lighter in some ways. The burden has been lifted. Confessing our sins takes us back to the cross. Christ crucified. And after we received that forgiveness, then the Holy Spirit can flow unhindered into our lives because it's not a burden. And so if you confess your sins to Christ, that's when you'll be closest to God because you'll be clean now. You, there's nothing hidden between you and God. You've confessed things. And if you feel actually sometimes people say, well, I confess sins and I don't feel that way, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're not believing that Christ has forgiven you. If you still feel burdened after you confess your sins, it's not a matter of what Christ is deficient in. It's your faith. Then something is in you is not really believing that Christ's death is sufficient for the payment of your sins. That is why you don't feel forgiven if, you, if, if that doesn't work for you. It is a matter of your understanding of Christ has truly paid it all. All for our sins. And that by his grace, because of his death, his Christ crucified, you are forgiven by grace as a free gift. And so that's when I feel closest to Christ, when I confess my sins. And immediately afterwards, I mean, there's no better feeling. There's nothing between me and him. All my sins are confessed. He's forgiven them. He's, he's paid for them all. And he loves me. Man, that's, that's the closest I'll ever feel to Jesus when I've confessed my sins. And so the Holy Spirit enters into our lives when we receive the crucified Christ as a sacrifice for our sins. And that's what he asks us to do, to remember the crucified Christ. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Have you forgotten the cross? Have you forgotten Christ crucified? Foolish Galatians, why are you being circumcised all over again? Why are you following the laws and saying that that will bring you salvation? And so God gives us the Holy Spirit through the cross of Christ by paying for our sins. Now, how do we allow the Holy Spirit then to enter into our lives? Paul answers this question by asking a rhetorical question. Excuse me, by asking a rhetorical question in verse 2. Okay, He answers the question of, how do we allow the Holy Spirit to enter our lives? Verse 2 of Galatians 3. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did you receive the Holy the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? See, Paul already knew the answer to this question. And Paul also knew that the Galatians knew the answer to this question. The Galatians already knew the answer to that question. Of course, the Galatian believers knew that they did not receive the Holy Spirit or salvation by being circumcised because they weren't circumcised at the time they believed. Of course, they received the Spirit only by grace. And they knew that they did not receive the Holy Spirit or salvation by any other works of the law, by circumcision or any other law. No, it's when the Apostle Peter first preached the good news to a Gentile named, uh, a Gentile Roman centurion named Cornelius and his household. They were Gentiles, mind you. When Peter preached the good news to Cornelius and his household, uncircumcised Gentiles, the Holy Spirit came upon them when they believed. That's in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. When Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Imagine that. They saw with their own eyes the Holy Spirit falling upon the uncircumcised Gentiles when they believed in Christ. They weren't circumcised, and yet they believed, they received salvation, the forgiveness of their sins, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. 
What further proof do you need? Even the, even the Jews who were standing there witnessing that they were amazed by this. And so it was clear that God accepted these uncircumcised Gentiles as fellow believers in Christ, as fully saved by grace through faith, though they had not followed the Jewish law of circumcision. And so the question is, so how did the Holy Spirit come upon the Gentiles in Galatia? The answer is, not by works of the law, but by hearing with faith. Let me ask you this, verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Obviously, by hearing with faith. They didn't observe any laws before they received the salvation of Christ and the Holy Spirit. It's not by works of the law, but by hearing with faith. They heard the, word, the good news and they received it by faith. So these Gentile believers were uncircumcised, yet God accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit. They saw it with their own eyes and acts. So Paul goes on to say in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? So the Galatian believers received salvation by grace and received the Holy Spirit just like Cornelius and the Roman, the Roman centurion Cornelius and his household did, just like other Gentiles did. They received salvation already. They received the Holy Spirit. But then they were trying now to live out their Christian lives, their li Christian lives by works, by the flesh. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? What got into you? And so now they were trying to live out their Christian lives by works. And Paul says, are you so foolish? Are you now being perfected by the flesh, having already begun by the Spirit? In other words, after receiving salvation by grace through faith, are you now trying to live out your life as a believer by your own strength, by your own flesh? How ridiculous that is. How ridiculous for you to start by grace and now trying to live out your lives by works. How foolish you are. How ridiculous that sounds. Trying to live out your life as a believer on your own strength. You will always fail. You will fail if you try to live it by your own strength and not by the Spirit, that it comes by grace. And so Paul points out to the Galatian believers that the Holy Spirit continues to dwell in them and work miracles among them. And so Paul asks in verse 5, Galatians 3, verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, the answer is obviously by hearing with faith. That we continue to live out our Christian lives by hearing with faith. It's obvious. Okay, It's not by works. The Holy Spirit came upon you by works. I mean, not by works, by grace. And so we all began our lives as believers by grace, through faith, and now we must continue to live only by grace, through faith. Now there are two ways that we can hear something because he says, did you receive the uh, Spirit by works or by hearing with faith? Right? By hearing with faith. And in verse 5 he said, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? There it is again. Hearing with faith. And so there are two, basically two ways that we can hear things. Okay, there are two ways that we can hear something. The first thing we can hear by is by our ears. We can hear with the ear. We can hear it with our ears. We can hear the voice. We can hear the words. And it goes into our minds. That's one way we can hear, with our ears. The second way Paul says that you can hear is you can hear with faith. You can hear with faith. 
And only hearing with faith opens the door to the Holy Spirit working in our lives. See, God empowers us with his Holy Spirit when we respond to the good news, when we respond to his word with faith. That's hearing with faith, responding to the Holy Spirit, responding to the good news, and responding to his word with faith. Not just hearing with the ears, but responding with faith. This means that doing just Christian activities on your own strength, in themselves, do not guarantee the Holy Spirit's presence. Doing Christian things, you know, we can do a lot of church activities, does not mean and do not guarantee the Holy Spirit's presence. We can do church activities. We can go to Bible studies all you want. We can go to Sunday school classes. We can listen to this live stream. You can hear the preaching of the word. But if there's no hearing with faith on our part, then it's just a lot of activity with very little benefit. If there's no hearing with faith right now as you listen to me and listen to the word, if there's no hearing with faith when you go to a Bible study, if there's no hearing with faith, but only hearing with the ears, it's no benefit. Okay, like I said, there's two ways to hear. You can hear with your ears or you can hear with faith. And hearing with faith requires that we respond, how we respond to his word. How we respond with our faith. And do we hear with faith? Because without hearing with faith on our part, it's just activity with very little benefit. We may be very busy, but we won't have the empowering power of the Holy Spirit in our lives unless there is hearing with faith. And this is why we such we put such a high priority on the Word of God in this church. And everything we do in order to give people as many opportunities as possible to respond to the hearing of God's word. Not hearing with your ears, hearing with faith. We have to give you as many opportunities as possible. It doesn't guarantee people will hear with faith. People can just hear me and go in one ear and out the other, as I'm sure they do, right? But for those that hear with faith, okay, there's a great benefit. Because it's not me, it's the word of God empowering you through the Holy Spirit. We have to give as many opportunities as possible for people to hear with faith. In this way, we can be a Bible-centered, faith-hearing, Holy Spirit-empowered believers in Christ in our daily lives. That's how you become Holy Spirit-empowered. By hearing with faith through responding to his word. And so because God loves to work through his Holy Spirit in those who respond to his word with faith, this then is how we are to hear. Okay, hear with faith. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, the prophet writes, All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You hear that? This is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Do you tremble at God's word? Or you just say, this is just a book. You know, it's like anything else I pick up. I'll just read it and just, you know, flip it and just close it. It's just a book. Doesn't mean much. Just words. Goes in one ear, out the other ear. Or do we hear it with faith? Do we tremble at his words? If this is God's word to us, I take this seriously. And if this is what he says that I must do, I must really examine my life and respond somehow to his word. Do I tremble at his word? See, I tremble at his word all the time because I realize how far I, I fall, you know, compared to his word. How far I fall short of what he calls me to do. How he calls me to repentance every day so that I must confess every day my sins. 
how um, he calls us to faith, even in the midst of trial, and even in the midst of being blessed, he calls me to faith. I tremble at his word because I know it is his truth to me. It is his word to us. It's not just a book. As he says, this is to whom I will look. He who is humble, contrite in spirit. That means repentant. Contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And so God responds to those who hear his word with faith. Hears his word with faith by empowering them with his Holy Spirit. We need to hear with faith, not just hear with our ears. It's a matter of our response to his word and how we tremble or not at his word. So God offers the Holy Spirit through the cross of Christ and we open the door for this Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. Now there is one more way, there is another way that God supplies his Holy Spirit to us that Paul talks about here in these verses. One other way that God supplies his Holy Spirit to us and that is through suffering. Look at verse three and four, or verse, yeah, three and four. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So when Paul asked that question, did you suffer so many things in vain? He's implying that the things that they suffered through as believers in Christ for the sake of Jesus, the things that they suffered through for the sake of Christ had a purpose. It was not in vain, but it had a purpose. That's what Paul is implying by that question. Their suffering was not in vain because it was for the sake of the good news of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. But even more than that, God gives us his Holy Spirit in times of great difficulty and in times even of suffering. Like all believers at that time, when the Galatians lived, the first century, when the Galatian Christians first received the good news, many faced challenges of all kinds. Many faced challenges. They were persecuted. They, some of them were disowned by their families and friends. How can you believe in this crucified Jesus that they say that came back to life, resurrected from the dead? Huh, that sounds foolish. How could you believe in that? And so many of them were disowned by their families and friends. Many of them faced economic hardships when they lost their jobs or were ostracized for their faith. They were persecuted. They faced hardship. They suffered for the good news. But God helped them through their hardships and their suffering by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. And so Paul writes, did you suffer so many things in vain now that you're going back to works? Now that you want to be circumcised like other Jews because you think that by works you're going to be saved, did you now suffer so many things in vain? Was that why you suffered? Was just all in vain? You suffered for the good news of Christ by grace. And now you're throwing that all away. Did you suffer in vain? If indeed it was in vain? As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Did you see that? For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. What gave them that joy in their affliction? The Holy Spirit. What helps us in our time of suffering? It's the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes to us 
in suffering, in their affliction. For you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. God gives us his Holy Spirit during our afflictions. Todd Wilson, one of the uh, authors of a, a Bible commentary that I, I, I use, says this. See, some people think that God only works after you've cleaned everything up in your life. See, some people think that. after you, well, God only works in your lives after you first cleaned everything up in your lives first. It's like when we only invite guests to our house after we've cleaned everything up, right? We only invite guests to our house only if you've cleaned everything up and you've put everything away and after you've mopped the kitchen floor and taken out the trash and vacuumed the carpets and you've washed the windows and you've dusted the shelves and even you've given your kids a bath first. That's the only time when you invite guests to your house, only when everything is clean and put away and as it should be. Only then can we invite someone to our home and that's the same way many people tend to think about God and the Holy Spirit in their lives. That God only likes to show up when everything is cleaned up in our life. That the Holy Spirit will only show up when everything in our lives is as it should be. That's how some people believe. I mean, believe, right? right? Be honest. That the Holy Spirit will only come when everything is as it should be in their lives when the rough patches in our lives are over with, and when we've already dealt with our difficulties, when it's all over, then I can get right with God. When all our problems and, and difficulties and suffering and, and problems and issues that I'm dealing with, when that's all done with, then I can get serious about my faith. Then I can c go back to church. Only after the suffering's over, only after the problems are over. Wait a minute. Why are you avoiding God when you have problems? That, shouldn't that be the time, the very time you should come close to God, to Christ? And we do the opposite because we're deceived. We're deceived by Satan thinking, well, you know, you can't go to God now. Your life's a mess. You still sin. You still have problems. You still have issues. Stay away from the church. They don't want you there. That's what Satan lies tell you. So only after our lives are cleaned up, then the Holy Spirit will work. Only when we've got everything put away and everything's dealt with, then and only then the Holy Spirit will work in our lives. That's what some of us believe. But if that's how you tend to think, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, says this, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, not cleaned up, not everything as it should be, not everything dealt with. No, while you're still a sinner, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till our lives were cleaned up first. He wants you to come in your time when you are suffering because that's when the Holy Spirit works through us. If you are received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In affliction, the Holy Spirit comes. Not after your life is all dealt with your difficulties and the rough patches are over and everything's as it should be. That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan to believe that. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you ever met someone who has been experiencing a great amount of suffering and yet still has great faith in Christ? Okay, I've met people like that. Maybe you have. And it's a humbling to see. It's amazing to witness a person who experienced a great amount of suffering and yet still has great faith in Christ. It's amazing to witness their strength, and their strength, and they will say it's not from themselves. It's through the Holy Spirit within. It's not me, they say, but it's God that I have strength. Strangely, God's Holy Spirit does not enter into 
the pristine, perfect lives that we think that we have to have before Christ will come in us, before the Holy Spirit can work in us. The Holy Spirit does not enter into perfect lives, but in broken lives, tattered lives, messed up lives like yours and mine. That's where the Holy Spirit works, in messed up lives like mine, broken lives, tattered lives. And so we learn not to become bitter and begrudge the difficulties in our lives, though we all do that for, to some extent. I do that. I tend to become bitter when things are difficult or begrudge the difficulties in our lives. Though we all do that to some extent, we learn not to do that. Because God gives us the Holy Spirit in the midst of our affliction. And he may use it for his greater purpose. He may use even that suffering, that affliction, for his greater purpose that we cannot yet fathom. Now, I don't know all the answers as to why some of us may suffer or be afflicted by the ways we have, but I do know that God can use it. Just like Jesus used the cross, that was an evil thing that they did to Jesus, crucify an innocent, innocent man, and yet that very evil thing that was done to Christ, when they nailed him to a cross, though he had never sinned, nor did not deserve any of that treatment, beat, whipping, whipped, right, lashed, crowned with a crown of thorns, though that was an evil thing, God used it for good. God used it for our salvation. And he can do the same for our suffering too. Okay? God can use and be within us, with, with us in the midst of our affliction and use it for his greater purpose. God supplies his Holy Spirit in times of great difficulty and suffering to use it toward his greater purpose. He can use anything, including evil. What was done for evil? The crucifixion of Christ. God could use it for good. What he was intended for evil, as Joseph said, when he was sold by his brothers into slavery, remember? And what did he say at the end of Genesis? My brothers, I forgive you. What you intended for evil, God used for good. And that's our lives. Suffering can also be used for good. God is with us in his Holy Spirit, even amidst our affliction. And so the Holy Spirit enters our lives when we receive Jesus, the crucified Jesus, as our Savior. We go back to the cross. God responds to those who hear his word with faith. Not hearing with our ears, but hearing with faith. And the Holy Spirit is with us, especially in times of suffering and in hardship. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit lives in us and every believer. That, Father, you don't wait till our lives are cleaned up or perfect, that every little sin is dealt with, that every problem we're going through is dealt with, that all our problems are, 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 are past us before you come to us, Lord. But no, rather, Lord, it's in the midst of our affliction. When our lives are not perfect, when we are broken, in fact, when we're beaten down, when we are tattered, that's when you come to with, with us by your grace, through your Holy Spirit. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you're with us now, you're with me now, because we are weak. We are thankful that you are working with us and love us, whether or not the live stream is working the way it should or whether our lives are working in the way it should or whether um, we have been as we should, Lord, that we have failed you. But Father, you show us grace and we can come back to the cross every day. And so, Father, right now, I pray in Jesus' name that you help each of us come back to the cross right now. That we come back to the cross, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. I may have been a believer for decades, or I may have been a believer only for a few months, but either even so, Lord, I still come back to the cross. We all come back to the cross.
It's only by your grace that you give us your forgiveness and you give us your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.